I'm delighted to be here because this is really a great city and I've been coming down here some, um, for many, many years, but really pretty intensively right after Katrina and have just absolutely fallen in love with your city and all the opportunities for it. I need to... Um, uh, doesn't that look like a great high-tech picture <laughs> of New Orleans? Um, so how many of you have heard of Horatio Nelson Jackson? One person, I'm impressed. Um, you're telling me the truth? What's that? So let me tell you the story, because I think he's a great example of sort of where we are today. Horatio Nelson Jackson was a doctor from Vermont, and he was in California at a medical convention out to dinner with a group of other doctors, and they were debating the impact of the automobile on American society. And Horatio thought it was a game changer. It was going to fundamentally alter society. And all the other doctors, smart people that they were, thought it was really going to be a toy for the rich and have very little impact. And he bet them all $50 that night he could drive across the United States in 90 days. And they all laughed and took the bet. And the very next day, Horatio went out and bought his first car. He convinced the young mechanic, Seawall Crocker, to go with him. For whatever reason that day, they bought a dog named Bud. And the very next day, with no plan, no support, uh, they're on the road driving across the United States. It was 1903. And in 1903, there were 150 miles of paved road in the United States, 8,000 cars, and no highway department in any state. Um, Horatio, 60, Horatio Seawall and Bud, 63 days later, drove down Fifth Avenue in New York City. They were the first people to drive across the United States. That was 1903. By 1923, there were 10 million cars hundreds of thousands of miles of paved road and a highway department in every state. The world as we knew it changed completely in those 20 years. And as we talk tonight, we're really looking at a 20-year framework. Uh, we are there where Horatio Nelson Jackson was in 1903, looking at a future where it's going to fundamentally change, not incrementally, but in, in a very big way. And globalization and technology and climate change are doing that right now. And for those of you who are in school, um, what a remarkable moment in time you're living in uh, as, as you look at the world, how you see the future, as Horatio did or those doctors do, will in many ways determine uh, the impact that you will have and the success that you will have in your career. And these are forces that we are looking at and are changing uh, the world. So if I go to any port, which I've done from Baltimore to Miami, so Baltimore and Norfolk and uh, Savannah and Jacksonville and Charleston and um, Miami and Gulfport and New Orleans and Houston are all spending literally hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars uh, to compete in a different world. The Panama Canal is getting expanded in 2014 to permit the big ships from China to come not just go to Long Beach in California but to come to the East Coast and they're all chasing that business and they need deeper ports, and New York needs to spend a billion dollars to lift up a bridge and uh, to get these ships underneath it. And, and they're all chasing that, and the infrastructure that states are investing in are fundamentally changing as they chase that business affected by globalization. Um, uh, this is the employment changes in a, just a, a cross-section of American cities over the last 20 years. Uh, look at New Orleans. New Orleans has lost a third of its um, uh, manufacturing jobs in the last 20 years since 1990, but in the same period of time, there are now twice as many jobs related to te uh, technology, university and education and technology jobs. Look at uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia lost 50% of its manufacturing jobs, and so it has now almost um, two and a half times more people working in technology-related jobs than they do in manufacturing jobs. And so what does that, what's the, what's the infrastructure, if I think of manufacturing, I think of um, industrial parks and I think of highways and rail that you need as infrastructure, what would you think of as the infrastructure for those technology jobs? Technology. What's that? Universities. Universities. What else? Cyber optics. Hmm? Cyber optics. So education. Um, technology, 
investment in research, maybe transit that moves people around more efficiently than the, what the highways do, which you don't need for trucks and everything. So this change begins to redefine how we think about managing the future and how, what the investments in infrastructure and education are, are the competitive advantages of a region. And we're watching this change dramatically right now. Um, and, and you went through a remarkable change. This is that when you fell off the cliff, that's Katrina. Uh, and you can watch. You're not back to where you were, but you can see the dramatic growth and employment uh, in education and health care uh, as this biomedical uh, district gets built out, how New Orleans is beginning to change in that regard. Um, and this is a, a recent study by Jones Lang LaSalle that shows in the last 18 months, and this came out in February, um, in the last 18 months, uh, the technology sector has grown four times faster than the economy as a whole. And I mean, that you would think, okay, Silicon Valley, Boston, the obvious places, but Pittsburgh's on there, and, and San Diego's on there, and Austin, uh, Texas is on there, and um, Raleigh Durham is on there, places you might not think about that that have fundamentally and in a very intentional way, which I'll talk about later, changed, made a decision to change their economies. Sometimes, as in Pittsburgh's case, out of necessity, others because uh, of other reasons. But, but this is the beginning of how the rules are changing uh, for urban areas particularly and how uh, cities are going to become uh, competitive. I, I mentioned demographics. It's not only that we're gaining population, uh, and we're adding a lot of people. It's what's going on within the, within, in the population. There are people like me. Um, very few of you here read AARP magazine, right? Uh, uh, it took me five years to claim that deduction when I can say I'm a senior citizen. But, but, but that, uh, if you read AARP magazine, you, AARP magazine, what you would know is almost every month they have articles about the best places to live. Uh, for seniors, and those places in Evely, the best small cities in America, the best cities in America, and New Orleans ranks high in one of those because the places that my generation increasingly want to live are walkable places that are vibrant, that have good culture and the arts and um, good housing and reasonably priced. Uh, and where am I describing? I'm describing your city, and I'm describing a city that um, we made in Pittsburgh. And, and so, so you have the, the, what is now the second largest population uh, in America, um, the baby boomers, looking increasingly not at suburban living now, but wanting to move um, back to a, an easier place to live. Um, and at the same time, most of you, um, the, uh, the Gen Yers, 83 million of you, the largest population cohort in American history from 18 to 32 years old. You know, you're, you're six times, if you're 24 years old, and most of you, are, some of you are younger than that, you're six times less likely to have a driver's license than your parents. Did you know that? How many of you have driver's licenses? Actually, how many don't? Oh my God, you ruin it. <laughs> so, so what, what, six times, that's a General Motors survey. So I, I grew up in a generation that, you know, there are songs written about the love of the automobile, right? And, and now General Motors is worried that that is not the case. Uh, ULI has done, Urban Land Institute has done some surveys of Gen Wires and find that 75% of you want to live in walkable places. Maybe not necessarily in big cities, in, but small towns even that are more walkable. And, um, and, and part of that is the economy. You're coming into a I mean, the average Gen Yer is carrying $25,000 in debt of college, edu college debt and coming into a housing market that has been unlike any in our history uh, uh, where the values have lost, been lost in, in many markets. And so your view of sort of how you, the choices that you want to make and how you want to live are very different um, than your parents' choices. Uh, and that has huge implications about real estate and about where uh, how cities will develop. Um, the other is, you know, even at ULI, very smart national developers thought when the recession hit that this was going to go away, uh, that we weren't going to see the, you know, back, really about seven or eight years ago that became a big issue about green buildings and, uh, and then the recession hit and 
People thought this was really going to be seen as a luxury. And so we are watching major corporations like Walmart, like PNC Bank, which is the fifth largest bank in America, running advertisement and saying we have more um, green certified buildings than any company on the planet. Uh, why is that happening? They, it is happening because they see it as still very important, but also it is now a, an important part of the economy of the real estate industry uh, to, to begin to do this. Um, and part of what is driving this, and when we talk about a sustainability, in my view, uh, is sustainability is really built very much around the connection between how you land use and transportation and infrastructure. And this is a great study that Tallahassee did. Uh, uh, around Tallahassee expects to add uh, 50,000 households in the next 20 years. Uh, and uh, those 50,000 households, if everybody gets their piece of paradise, one unit per acre, it will cost Tallahassee almost $10 billion to build out the infrastructure. If they, um, if they build to eight units per acre, it will cost Tallahassee over the next 20 years a billion dollars to build out that infrastructure. If they uh, build to 20 units per acre, which is sort of a, a, a new, a, a, you know, a smart growth development pattern of townhouses and single family detached and some apartments, it will only cost them a half a billion dollars to absorb the same population. So think about that. Think about how many cities in America see sprawl as growth and opportunity rather than, in a sense, cutting their own throats by driving a much higher tax structure because they're not efficiently thought about the investments they have to make in infrastructure depending on the land use. And, and then this doesn't get into the transit and the issues of uh, with 20 units per acre, you can start talking about transit. At one unit per acre, you're not talking about much transit because it, it's so much sprawled. Um, and so I hear this all the time. You know, I was standing in line a couple weeks ago at the post office, and there was a long line of us waiting, and there was one lone clerk helping out, and there were other clerks in the back, but none of them came out to help. And a guy in front of me said, uh, he just said, you know, I wish government would get out of the way. Uh, I don't know who would deliver the mail then, right? But, uh, uh, but, and I've heard that from lots of developers. And in fact, I believe opposite. I believe that a successful 21st century is going to have strong entrepreneurial government uh, uh, with a, a, a partnership between the universities uh, and, the, uh, and the private sector, the business community in that. I don't think you can have truly a successful city without a successful uh, efficient government. And I want to talk about what makes a 21st century city. Uh, the city, first and foremost, to sort of get in the game needs to be well managed. It needs to be vibrant. It needs to be committed to education for its, as for its citizens. It needs to be entrepreneurial. It needs to have raw materials. And it needs to be, um, it needs to have capital for, at different levels for different things. And, um, and let's talk about that. One of the, the blessings and the curses of America is that we have 74,000 local governments and 13,000 school districts. And we talked about being in a global economy. Think about that. We're competing with Germany and the UK, China, that have very much centralized education systems and uh, centralized, largely centralized land control and development patterns and investments in infrastructure. And yet we depend on hundreds of thousands of people that elected to local governments and elected to um, school boards to make the right decisions to permit us to compete in a global economy. And, and, and that's part of the challenge of every community, whether it's New Orleans or Pittsburgh, of how, you know, when I say I'm coming to New Orleans, I don't distinguish between St. Bernard's Parish and New Orleans and uh, Tammany Parish across the lake. I think of it New Orleans, right? And, and yet the competition here is intense and much of the resources of the region are used to compete with each other rather than uh, with, uh, with, with the rest of the world uh, where you're competing. And that becomes a, a major discussion. When I was mayor of Pittsburgh, um, I would go to central, northern West Virginia or eastern Ohio, and inevitably, if I walked into a store, stopped at a gas station, people would say, Mayor, why are you here? You know, I, I was in Ohio. I wasn't anywhere near Pittsburgh, and, and yet they saw me uh, as the mayor, because many of them come to Pittsburgh to work. And, uh, and, and, and we built a new airport uh, shortly after I became mayor. It opened, and uh, it, it wasn't 
people would come in and say, what a great new airport you have, Mayor. And I, would, I wouldn't have the heart to tell them that they had <coughs> driven through seven municipalities to get to, the, uh, to Pittsburgh coming from the airport. And there were more people from West Virginia working at our airport than there were from the city of Pittsburgh. Because we, we didn't think of ourselves as that region, and yet people, everybody else does. And so how that decision is made, and Denver is a good model. If you've been to Denver lately, and some of you were there last week, and if you went down to the end of the 16th Street Mall, you saw the impact of this. John Hickenlooper, then mayor of uh, Denver, brings together 32 uh, local government leaders and seven counties who all stand up, Republican and Democrat, stand up to ask the voters to approve a sales tax across uh, the metropolitan Denver area to build 120 miles of uh, transit system. If you go to Denver now, that's under construction. If you've been down where Union Station is, uh, down to the end of the 16th Street Mall, you see billions of dollars of investment being made because of this in infrastructure investment. You see uh, transit-oriented development being built at some of the 78 stops on this system. That was a decision Denver made to become a 21st century city, to not think about the old rules that we have all this congestion, we need to build more roads uh, to, get, to, get, to deal with the congestion, but to think about what are the investments we make, to think about how we compete and move people around and, and, support, and have mobility in a different kind of way. Um, New York City, and this is relevant for all of you, is a very, and New Orleans is a very um, a great example. You know, the homicide rate in, and you can look at the homicide rate in 1990 in New Orleans was almost 2,500 people were murdered in a year. Uh, some of you weren't even alive back then, maybe, but I, I remember New, or uh, New, or New York was losing, beginning to lose um, their tourism. They were beginning to have industry and businesses talk about moving out of New York because of the fear of crime. They elect a new mayor, Rudy Giuliani, who hires a police commissioner, Bill Bratton, and they make a, 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 an intentional decision to change how New, how New York was managed. And within a year and a half, they reduced the homicide rate uh, fivefold. They moved all the bad guys to New Jersey. Um, they didn't do that. They, they figured out how to manage crime in a different kind of way than any police department had in the country. And using technology and using um, uh, management techniques that put police in front of the homicides before they were committed. How do you stop them? And not just react to them and investigate them. And it, it was a remarkable example in police departments all across the country. When I was mayor, we copied them. You see it on TV shows now called Comstat, of how police are held accountable, how there's real-time information reporting crime, and how, how police departments focus on that crime to get in front of it. And it's a remarkable example of well-managed. I believe that a 21st century city is going to be successful. If you've got to get the basics right. It's got to be safe. It's got to be clean. It's got to be a city that has reasonable taxes and the right kind of investments, the willingness to invest in infrastructure. You have this better than most cities in America. This is, this is Millennium Park in Chicago, uh, which is a great example of a city's choice to build something that uh, really captured people's imagination. You have that more than virtually any other city in America. You have a huge vibrancy in this city. And how you build on that, and you have, uh, and it's, a, it's a magnet for young people to want to want to be here. A, a key part of this, we talked about it, what's the competitive advantage of a, of, a, of a city that's lost half as manufacturing and has added um, twice as many technical jobs? What's the key competitive advantage is education? And I particularly want you to look at the, at the top, the research triangle. Because the research triangle 20 years ago was already well on its way, but it's up there, you don't think of it, but it's up there with Boston and San Francisco, and I'll talk about that a little later, about how that all happened and the choices they made. So you see high school graduation rates, 90 to 2010, and bachelor's degrees and graduate degrees, and each of them are important decisions that a community makes of how they're investing in the future. Without uh, uh, an increasing percentage of those people, it becomes more and more difficult for a community to compete in a, in a new economy. And this is a, an example. The blue line are people with just high school edu edu educations. And this is through the recession, uh, just since uh, you can see through with just a high school education. Uh, the red lines are people with a community college education in the 
And the green line are people with a college education or higher. That's why you want to stay in school. Um, and, 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 and that trend is going to continue because the kind of jobs that are being created in an economy uh, are jobs that will need that kind of education. Let me give you a couple of examples. And I, Boston and, Cal Boston and um, San, the San Francisco Bay Area, for me, are not good models. They're, they're remarkable places, but they're not good models because it happened organically. Uh, it grew out of uh, research, huge government research invested in right after World War II, and it was a sort of an organic process that developed these remarkable technology hubs. Um, and so what, I, what interested me is that where communities made a decision to intentionally become something other than what they were. And the research triangle was the first one. True story, literally six guys go to a country club to play golf and get rained out, and they're in the country club lamenting the fact that they spend all this money to send their kids to college, and then they don't come back to the research triangle because there was really nothing to do but tobacco and lumber. And, and so those six guys go and buy 7,000 acres of land and create a nonprofit corporation and call it the Research Triangle. Uh, and, and they partner with the universities and they partner with state and local leaders. And, and today, fast forward 40 years, the Research Triangle has the highest per capita income and the highest um, educational level of any area of the country. None of that existed. It was an intentional partnership formed between government, the civic leadership, uh, and the universities to fundamentally shift the economy of that region. Uh, more recently in San Diego, uh, San Diego was a sleepy naval town. It had a, essentially a very weak University of Can California, San Diego. The, the mayor uh, and civic leadership went to the state and said, we want you to locate an engineering school in the, uh, late, in the, in the 70s in the, uh, at the University of California, San Diego, and we're going to commit hundreds of acres of land next to it to create a research uh, center and work with the private industry to, to crack buildings. If you've been to San Diego, you will know that it, other than the Navy, it is the, it is, it is the sixth fastest growing technology economy in the country of any region. Uh, it's the sixth largest. It, Qualcomm and hundreds of businesses have now spun out of that university engineering department, and it has fundamentally uh, redefined the, um, intentionally redefined the economy of San Diego a in a different kind of way. Uh, um, in Florida, the most recent one is Jeb Bush committed $300 million to attract the Burnham Research Institute to Central Florida, and a developer there uh, in a big, he owned 7,000 acres, donated six, 600 acres to the effort to create what is called a medical city. There is now this research institute there, there is a medical school, there are several hospitals, uh, there are several other research institutes, and there's 15, not 5,000, but 15,000 jobs now uh, being created in this medical city. So that if I go to Orlando, and what do you think of when I say Orlando? You think of Disney World and tourism, that is still the largest employment sector. The second largest employment sector in the Orlando area now is education and healthcare. It, this is having a huge impact on the whole Orlando area and beginning to shift uh, their economy. Uh, I, I mentioned that, that the bright spots really are beginning to be places around the country. It grows. I, this is the raw materials. This is our country's competitive advantage, I believe. We spend $400 billion a year on research. About a third of that comes from the federal government. Uh, it goes to universities. It goes to um, uh, private research institutes. But it is, it's the raw material. It's the opportunity to drive the intellectual capacity of, of a region. And, and we, as you can see, spend far more than any other country in the world on, on research. And it is, I believe, the reason that our economy um, is, is so competitive. Uh, around the world. And the other piece of this is the, is the availability of venture capital. So I want you to think about that raw material, those research dollars, and between Tulane and LSU, several hundred million dollars a year come into the New Orleans e area for, for research. So think of that as the oil in the ground. And the question 
that oil in the ground has no value. I would say if you were in Pittsburgh, coal in the ground, and that, that has no value. You need to build an infrastructure to take advantage of it. You need to build um, the infrastructure to take advantage of it. And this is one of the pieces of that infrastructure to take advantage of the intellectual capacity uh, that you have here now that you're building in a remarkable kind of way in the bio district. Uh, of, 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 of venture capital, that risk capital, how many of you saw the social network as a case in point? Mark Zuckerberg starts Facebook in Boston when he's a student at Harvard and he wants to get to a million subscribers. Uh, he thinks that's going to be heaven for him and he, his friends say, well, but you've got to go to California. Uh, because that's where the venture capital really is. And, and he does, and as you know, Facebook has 800 million subscribers, and it's headquartered in with thousands and thousands of jobs in California. And, and, and that's what drove it, the availability of that venture capital. And, you know, that's the good news is that we, the United States, over, over, far and away has more venture capital availability than any other place in the world. The bad news for all of us is that the venture capital in the United States goes to three places. So two-thirds of the venture capital in the United States goes to California, the San, San Francisco Bay Area, to Boston, or to uh, New York area. And so New Orleans or Pittsburgh or places like that, you'll grow a, a maybe a potential new Facebook, but the odds are that person will move to go to where the venture capital is and move the company. And so part of the infrastructure you need to build to capture this remarkable opportunity that's being created in the bio district will be to build this, and this is one important piece of it. These are the investments that have been made over the last 10 years with Tulane, and, and you can see you were beginning to, in 06, 07, and particularly 09, beginning to have some impact. Uh, but this is an area, you have the raw material. The question of whether you want to take advantage of it is, part of the decisions that New Orleans will have to make. I want to talk a little bit about my second favorite city. Um, how many of you have been to Pittsburgh? So some of you have been there. Well, you might not know it was once known as hell with the lid off. How would you like to become mayor of a city that was once known as hell with the lid off? Pittsburgh, uh, Pittsburgh was, was the most environmentally degraded city in America. It was the center of steel making and iron ore. Those rivers that you see are there, we would regularly catch on fire because you, somebody would throw a match in them and they were so polluted. And, uh, and between 1970 and 1990, the Pittsburgh region lost 500,000 people, left Pittsburgh, because the steel industries were collapsing. So it was a larger population loss than New Orleans faced after Katrina. Um, that's why there are so many Steeler fans here. Um, because people left Pittsburgh uh, and went all places where they could find work. And here, the oil and gas industry in Houston and in, in the Florida were lots of Pittsburghers uh, moved to. And, and we were in free fall. And by the early 90s, it was not clear what we were going to be as a city. Uh, we were the second oldest population in the country. Uh, we had lost half the population of the city. Uh, from 620,000 people when I'm a young boy down to about 300,000 today. And so we were facing a real crisis of what we were going to be. And we made a decision um, to, to become, in a very intentional way, to become something else. Um, it had to do with how we invested the meager resources we had. It had to do with land use and how we use the land in Pittsburgh, a lot of old industrial property. And so that's part of what I want to talk about of, of the choices we made as a city. And, and we had to begin to do this in the, um, and through the 80s and in, particularly in the 90s. And what I've come to realize now is that every city is facing these challenges. We were forced to confront it earlier than many cities when other cities were doing OK. But because of the Horatio Nelson Jackson um, impact is that every, the rules are changing and every city needs to think about how they redefine themselves in this, in this new world we're in. And if, you, if you're going to sort of say that we're going to stay with the good old days, you're probably are, are not going to remain competitive. And so this is an example. This is a, a steel mill, one of many steel mills in Pittsburgh. And the year I became mayor, I had our redevelopment authority go out and buy thousands of acres of steel mills. So we bought this. Um, and for me, it was an emotional decision. My father worked in this steel mill for 51 years. Um, and so we're 10,000 
uh, men and women made steel, there's now a cheesecake factory. My father would shoot me if he were alive, okay? Uh, but it's a mixed use development, and I want to talk a little bit about this because this is a, we are a, a flat, broke city. We'd lost a half of our population. We hadn't had any major investments. But, but that's a decision that every city faces. I can go to any mayor in America today and say, you know, how's, how's business? And they'll say, boy, it's tough. We don't have any money. Cities always have money. So I would say to that mayor, so what's your budget? And the mayor of New Orleans would say, well, my budget might be a billion dollars. So I would say, well, don't tell me you don't have any money. Just what are your priorities? And, and part of that challenge of every city is that you can be like the hamster on the wheel. You can be running in place and investing uh, just in today the roads and stopping kids from shooting each other by hiring more police and at the end of the day nothing else changes you got to get that right but you also need to take some of those at energy and some of those resources and invest in the future there's some risk involved with that like buying 1500 acres of steel mills there's a risk in whether you can get anybody to be your partner with it but but we made a decision to invest and you can see we use TIF and we used almost $150 million worth of, private inv of public investment to clean up that steel mill, to put in the infrastructure, to buy in the interest, to share the risk with a private developer when nobody believed there was a market there for housing or for retail or for office buildings. Today, this is usually successful. It's, a, it's actually much uh, closer to $600 million of, uh, of private investment in that now. And it, uh, it has everything from a cheesecake factory to, um, to uh, office buildings to, uh, that house new technology to uh, successful retail operations. Uh, this is another example. And um, um, so uh, you have a, lots of Home Depots, right? So this neighborhood is a sketchy, failed urban renewal area of the 1960s. It was, um, and where this Home Depot is was an old Sears site. Uh, it had been Sears left. It was that bad. And uh, <laughs> Sears left, okay? Sears left the site. It was not a place that anybody would think about going to shop. It was five miles from the nearest interstate. We bought this piece of property, and we thought to ourselves, where do rich people and poor, poor people shop? And we decided Home Depot. And so we went to the Home Depot real estate people. This is in the mid-'90s, and said, we'd like you to think about investing um, in in a Home Depot in this area, and they laughed at us and it said, it's not where we would put our Home Depot. You know, we want to be on an interstate, and the closest Home Depot was 10 miles away, and, you know, it's not where we're going to go. So I called up the mayor of Atlanta, and I said, tell me about the two guys that home home, owned Home Depot, and he said, um, he told me about the two guys, and one, he said, Bernie Marcus, he said, is very philanthropic and very active in national Jewish affairs, and, um, and so I went to my friends in the Jewish community of Pittsburgh, and said, will you invite Bernie Marcus to a dinner in Pittsburgh? And, and Bernie Marcus came uh, to Pittsburgh for this dinner, and a friend of mine had a reception for him. And I had a bodyguard at the time, and my bodyguard went up to him with a gun and said, we're ki kidnapping you, Mr. Marcus. <laughs> and, and, and we took Mr. Marcus out to this site and showed him uh, and said, you know, share our dreams with us. We think you can transform this neighborhood by putting a Home Depot there. And, he said, boy, this is not where I would put a Home Depot. But at the end of the dinner, he came up to me and he said, we'll take a risk with you. We'll put a Home Depot there. And so we worked with them. And I mean, I got criticized for providing some public subsidy to clear the site and invest in a Home Depot. So the Home Depot went there. And just last month, I was out there buying some stuff and talking to the manager. It's the most successful Home Depot in the whole Pittsburgh market, uh, performing every suburban stores. But that's not the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that a young developer came to me then and said, you know, what you did there, we'd like to partner with you, and we think we could get Whole Foods to come to Pittsburgh. Whole Foods is not in Pittsburgh. Closest Whole Foods in Washington, D.C. And we talked to Whole Foods to come to Pittsburgh, and we provided support for them to go, and this young developer buys an old warehouse and puts a Whole Food in, and it's a rookie of the year store, meaning they have the highest volume Per, per square foot of any store in the country. And it's also the highest uh, amount of food stamps per square foot of any store in the country, which says rich people, poor people, as well as rich people, want to eat well, given the opportunity. And 
And, and so this would be like putting a Whole Foods in the middle of Central City. Uh, and think about that. And, uh, and, and, and so then a Target said, you know, we'd be interested in coming here. And we've now, private developers have said, we'd like to do 700 mixed income housing. And all that is there. And so how does Home Depot relate to Google? Because in this neighborhood was also an eight-story, actually a 10-story vacant Nabisco factory. And we had partnered with Carnegie Mellon University to build a technology uh, center on their campus where existing companies, not startups, but existing companies could ha sort of hang their hats when they were doing joint research. And Google was one of them. And they started with two. And within three or four years, they were out in the hallways. And Google decided what the research they were doing at CMU was really worthwhile. They've now moved 1,000 jobs to Pittsburgh. And, and a developer thought he'd died and gone to heaven because they said, we want to be in this vacant Nabisco factory uh, in this neighborhood that people wouldn't have gone to except for Whole Foods. 70% of the Google employees in that building either walk to work or ride a bike. That's what the future looks like. Whether cities can make the decisions to get there is the bigger challenge. And so we had a downtown that was failing. You see that box right there? That was our red light district. So there were 22 massage parlors and porno theaters 20 years ago there in that box. Led by the Heinz Endowment, your contribution by buying ketchup. Um, Howard Heinz had the idea there were two big old vaudeville theaters there. One was a strip joint and the other was vacant. He buys those and decides that he's going to put the symphony in one and a live theater in the other. And the Heinz Endowment largely makes a lot of investment. And, and, and now there are no massage parlors and uh, porno theaters, but there are 1,500 legitimate performances a year going on there. And I underline legitimate. <laughs> there's the ballet, and there's the opera, and there's the symphony, and there's the uh, live theater, and there are, we've now subsequently built five other venues for them to perform in. And I, I say that because it's probably one of the best examples I've seen in the country of how culture and the arts at a threshold of activity can drive economic activity. The, the first floors are filled with restaurants and um, in the, in the uh, galleries and the upper floors now are increasingly getting converted to housing. In fact, if you were at the ULI conference last week, you know one of those buildings in Pittsburgh got an award for excellence for mixed income housing that is in actually the Cultural Trust District developed by a young developer. So the Cultural Trust District start is actively going on and we, we decide that the, I want you to look at that. That's a baseball park. And, that's a football stadium, and that's a new convention center. And I want to tell you a story about that, because we were watching the cultural district just thrive with great public spaces and really great active uh, street life with culture and the arts going on. And a, right across the river, how many architects or wannabe architects in the room? So I want to know what you were all smoking and drinking in the 60s and 70s, OK? <laughs> so look at this. This is our football stadium, OK? And here you are right across the river from this cultural district. And what's the highest and best use of that wonderful waterfront? A road and a surface parking lot. What's that about? And then our team lost the Super Bowl, so that's what we did. We just blew it up, OK? We blew it up. And uh, no, we blew it up because we wanted to do something different. And we built a new football stadium, and we built a new baseball park. And we built a new convention center all at the same time, the largest certified green building in America, all right around the Cultural Trust District. And, and we um, let me go back to that map real quick. Um, um, and what we did was, um, you see that bridge right there. So it cost you $5 to park there in a number of garages we have for uh, day, daytime parking. And if you want to park at a baseball game over right there, it will cost you $35. So, Half the people going to a baseball game park downtown, walk across the bridge, which we shut down, put a band on it or so, because it's fun for the do. And so you end up, what's the symphony and baseball football have in common? They create huge vitality. 
in a city that was dying downtown. And, and so uh, we, uh, it's, a, it's about how you do urban planning. So that's where that parking lot and road was. We took the road off the river. We put parks in and uh, great public spaces like this. Is, these are 50 waterfalls that kids can climb on. It was a great architectural firm, EDAW, that now is part of ACOM that uh, did that. And, and, and we uh, took parking. You know, people would always yell, where are we going to put our, where are we going to park? We took the parking. How, why is the highest and best use of a waterfront to put parking on it? So we took the parking away and put um, a park all along the rivers. You can ride from, on a bike now from downtown Pittsburgh all the way to Georgetown in Washington, D.C. on a continuous off-road trail. Can you imagine? Who would have thought? Uh, it's a great bike ride. So, so should government get out of the way? I don't think so. I think government needs to partner with and be as entrepreneurial as the private sector in making things happen. And, and so this is, for me, the, the issues I've learned as mayor and I learned all over the country in visiting other cities is that at the end of the day, somebody needs to lead. Uh, if, you know, every time I went to a meeting, there were often hundreds of people there giving me a reason why we shouldn't do something. You know, people wanted to keep the old steel mill because they were worried about tearing it down and the traffic it would cause if anything we built there. And, and so we, all, we saw that, that so the dynamic is whether you're going to change and position your city to compete or whether you appeal to the status quo. And it's never easy. The second is, is where do you want to go? What's the strategy? And what I see with a lot of uh, people uh, is they get trapped in a transactional mentality. Is that this, we're going to develop this piece of property. We're going to develop the bio district. You're going to put $2.2 .2 billion in there, and, and that's a bio district. And is it, how does it relate to the surrounding neighborhood? Are you using it as a catalyst to connect into Cal, Canal Street and the uh, in the public housing community, Lafitte, uh, across the way. Is, are you seeing that strategically as, as how it connects and people working in that bio district that they could go out and enjoy themselves in the evening and live in Lafitte and walk over and, uh, and into Central City and on the other side? How is that being seen as a transaction, a big transaction, or is it seen as catalytic to change neighborhoods that need to be changed? That, that's a, that's, somebody needs to be the growing up in the room that's not looking at the transaction, but at the big picture. And how does that happen? And the other is, who does it? Who, what's the institutional capacity that is sophisticated and understands the financing, to understand how to make these things happen? When we buy a steel mill, you know, how do we figure out with no money to clean it up, to put in the infrastructure, to share the risk? With us to invest in a dead market when nobody is thinking that you could ever do anything with that steel mill. How, how, what's the, the public institutional capacity that can match the entrepreneurial spirit in the private sector? They're the challenges that a city faces now in trying to drive itself into the 21st century. Um, financing it. Nobody has any money. And yet all across America I see remarkable things happening. If you're not willing to invest in your future, Shame on you. You know, even in the most conservative, some of the most conservative places in the country is like Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City, for the last 12 years, every four years, the leaders of Oklahoma City have gone to the citizens and said, if you vote to increase the sales tax, we will build these things with the money we get in four years. And so they did it once, and people bought into it, and it's been approved twice more because people like what has happened in Oklahoma City. If you've been to Oklahoma City lately, you know they're putting themselves on the map. They're not only doing remarkable developments, uh, because they believe and they have to invest in their future, even in a very conservative Republican place. People understand that they need to invest in their future. And in fact, 77% of the referendums put on the ballot over the last 10 years even in the middle of this recession, about local infrastructure investments have passed in this country, which tells me that the local voters know more than the people they're electing about the decisions they ought to make to invest to make their cities and their regions competitive. And finally is the design. You know, I see this in every city. 
cities have a choice. You're a great example of a city uh, that has made a choice to excellence, with some exceptions. Uh, is that cities can, be, there's a disease in the water in some cities, it's called the it'll do disease. Is that cities make a choice to build it'll do kind of buildings. Or you can make a choice to build world class. The best example I know in the country is Millennium Park in Chicago. How many of you have been there? So you go to Millennium Park, you don't know that that was a railroad yard and Mayor Daley the railroad had abandoned the yard, and Mayor Daly said, we're going to buy it, and we're going to put a two-level parking garage and put a grass field on top of it just to extend Grand Park. And he went to the civic leadership of, of Chicago and said, you know, can you help us out with this? We need a little with some of the foundations. And some of the civic leaders said, no. If we're going to build something, let's not just do an it'll do kind of park. Let's do world class. Let's build something really exciting. It's our, it's our opportunity to do something. And so that park, that park morphed from a $50 million park to a $500 million park, largely raised from the private sector in Chicago. It is the most visited place in Chicago. It is, in many ways, has defined the new Chicago. And there is $2.2 billion next to it in terms of private real estate development. Even more recently, how many of you have been to the High Line? Who would have imagined? Who would have imagined that most people saw it as a huge liability? Two people, young people, with no architectural experience, stand up in a public meeting and when it, there's a discussion about tearing it down and say, no, let's keep it instead and let's create a park. Who would have ever heard of anything so silly, of putting a park on a 20 feet up in the air on a railroad track? So if you've been there, it's beyond imagining. And I was just on a panel in New York City, and at the end of the trestle, at the end of the High Line, you know, there is the um, railroad yards, the Hudson Yards is going to be developed. And right next to that is a five-acre site, a Brookside development is building. They're going to build five million square feet, multi-billion dollar development. And, and the fellow on, on the panel with, he is with Brookside, and his presentation is, starts with, we're just a block from the High Line. And we're thinking about extending the High Line into our development. Think about that. It, it is a huge example of how cities are seeing themselves in such a different way. And so every city is at this moment in time where Horatio was, sitting looking at the future. And you can be the doctors and say, you know, things are pretty good. You know, this is not going to be a big change. Or you can be Horatio and see the future. You know, in 1903, there were 53,000 harness makers in America. By 1923, there were 2,000. Do you want to be the harness maker? Or you want to be, you want to see the future? That's the choice of every community today. And particularly you, those of you under 30, you have a huge opportunity to drive this city in a different kind of way. It's a remarkable city. This is a jigsaw puzzle here in, in New Orleans. All the pieces are here. You're building this remarkable bio district. You have more vibrancy than virtually any city in America. You have incredible architecture. How it gets connected into being not just a remarkable city, but the world-class city is really up to all of you. Good luck.